So the first thing that you notice about the M17 is that it's a it's a massive beast of a thing. I mean, it's huge. I mean, to give you an idea of how big this actually is, is if I don't have my iPhone 12 Pro Max I'm using to record this. So the only thing I have equivalent in size is this old 6 Plus, which is almost as big as the 12 Pro Max or 13 Pro Max. And you can see it's as big as, well, pretty much the largest smartphone you can get. Of course, the screen is bigger because it uses a larger screen. But it's like when I took it out of the box, I checked and it's about the same size as my 12 Pro Max, but three times as thick and heavy. I mean, it has a 9200 milliamp battery pack in it. I mean, that's the size of batteries you get in those, you know, the chunky portable recharging units. And it's it's got ports for every, I mean, it's got full-size ports on the bottom. But I'll talk, let's have a look at that in just a bit. But to give in comparison, if I have the good old, I have the uh, M11 Plus here, if we pop that out of its case, we can see that it's, well, vastly bigger. It doesn't really show, and I mean, on this video, it probably doesn't show as much as it does if you actually hold these in person, but it's like, this doesn't feel heavy, this does. And the only funny thing is versus the M11 Plus is the port, the buttons are opposite. So the buttons, play, pause, and whatever on, are on actually on this side, whereas on the, the, on the right side, on the left side, on the right side on the M11 Plus. So it's kind of a little bit odd in that regard. If you want to have a look at the case, the case is, it has a case just like the M11 Plus case, but you can fit the M11 Plus in its case in there with a lot of room to spare. So it's massive. I mean, I, my hand, I have average size hands. I can stick my hand in there just about. With the, <laughs> it's like a fit my hand. I mean, if it was enclosed, I could use it as a pseudo mitten. It's huge. So, I mean, appropriately, of course, it comes with this desktop stand. And I'll talk about the stand in the second half of the video. But, I mean, it has a lot of features in here. Now, I've set it on set one of the features. Uh, you can see the pulsating light here. I set it on pulsating. You can set this light and the light under the volume control to anything from indicating the volume control, which I've set on here, or you can have it indicate, you know, the, how, if it's charging, you can have it pulsate or not pulsate or have it pulsate normally, which I did here. And you can set it to a number of different colors manually, or you can have it even indicate whether roughly how hot this is getting. And you think, why would you want to measure how hot the device is getting? This gets hot. <laughs> well, this is why you have a stand with a fan. But we'll show that. I just showed the pulsating thing so you can see the options. But you can set it fixed, off, on, you know, whatever you like, basically. The only thing, funny thing about this was I got this and... Uh, you know, first thing I thought, I want to set it to orange. I just feel like orange. There's no orange option. There's green, blue, cyan, you know, red, purple, yellow, but no orange. Oh, well. So talk about, is anyone getting a kind of gamer vibe from this thing? I am with all these kind of hexagonal shapes and the pulsating lights a bit. But, you know, I wanted actually, I thought before this was released, I was thinking, gee, I wish Theo would have something like, I want something like this iPad, but I want it with an amplifier, a really good desktop amplifier built in so I can have an all-in-one kind of music system. That would be really cool. And actually coming out with the M17, I think Fio has pretty much done this. But we'll talk about more that because in performance-wise, and that took where we can get into some of the features. Now, to get the main stuff out of the way, it has your normal selection of four different ports. You have your single-ended ports. You have, uh, you know, your 6.5 and 3.5 millimeter and your balanced 4.4 and balanced 2.5. So whatever you have, you've got some port for it. Now, the interesting thing about this is the single-ended ports on their own can either be set to phone out PO or line out. You can see the line out indicator. So there's a switch that you can just flip down in here and you can select that either of these, either the single-ended ports or the balanced ports go into line out mode, which it'll warn you about volume control. Now, if you do do that, and set one of them into line out. That's with a fixed volume, but there's also an option you can set inside the settings to make it variable volume. So you can make it a sort of DAC preamp if you like. Now, that's that's kind of handy because so if you do need, you will need an adapter cable 3.5 to, to RCA or 4.4 to XLR to use that. So you could use it say in a desktop setup here, and if you have active speakers on your desk or something like that, or a, a power amp or whatever, line out to that. 
or, or you can use this as a volume control optionally in the settings. Now, that's where we lead to, well, the input and output on the bottom. Now, we have one micro SD card slot, which will disappoint some people, but I think this is, some of it may have to do with Android, as I remember the M11, the original M11, which had two micro SD card slots, had some issues with the second micro SD card. So it could have something to do with the, to do with that, I'm not sure. But, I mean, you can get up to one terabyte cards, and be careful not to get those cheap ones, which are not actually one terabyte cards, but the, the proper SanDisk, or there's, I think, PNY and uh, some of the other reputable companies now have one terabyte cards. They're about, I think they're a hundred and something dollars. Well, they're over a hundred dollars anyway, or maybe closer to 200, I forget. But make sure you get a reputable card if you do get a high capacity card. Now for IO, we actually have two USB ports here. So one can be used for charging and IO if it's USB 3. So you can actually attach, I believe, storage to this and play music off it. And the other one for as a USB host, either to make this a DAC amp or as output to other USB capable DACs if you want to use this as a transport. Now in that regard you also have a full-sized SPDIF port which is pretty funny for a device of this type so you can actually use it as both ways which you can switch as so you can use this as a DAC from SPDIF although you're limited to 192k high res so you can't get you can't if you think you're doing upsampling to this for example from I use HQ player you want to use this USB port but you can also use it as SPDIF out to a, to a DAC of some kind. And you have a full-size DC input, which we'll see is very important because you have a desktop mode with this, which gives you double the power output to make it act pretty much like a desktop DAC amp. And I tested this, and we'll talk about that in the second half of the video. So there's a lot. And you can switch most of the main functions you can switch from here. So you can, you can see in the, the options, as I just talked about, some of the other useful ones you have, of course, is in vehicle mode, which means it will automatically power on if it senses power through, I guess, the USB port and automatically power off when that power is, uh, you know, when you turn the car off and the power stops. So I don't know if anyone will be using this in their car, but I have done it with other FIO DAPs and use that in vehicle mode for, you know, using it as a part of my music music system. You have uh, some other stuff. All to DSD, of course, it changes all the music to DSD64, and that makes this get quite hot. Some people might like that or might not. Um, I find it less of a value with, with modern DACs, but that's kind of another discussion. And you can have dark theme or light theme as necessary. And uh, I'll leave it in dark theme, but whichever. And the the mode choose, now we have, actually this has six modes. Now, old older FIO DAPs, such as the older M11, you could either have you know standard Android mode where you can use any software you want, which works on Android, this is Android 10. Or you can have pure music mode, which only when it boots straight into the FIO Music app. But now you also have, because of this I.O. on the bottom, you actually have USB DAC mode, Bluetooth receiving mode, so you can actually use it as a Bluetooth receiver, SPDIF I.O., you can use it, receive rather, and you can use this again as a DAC amp. And AirPlay as well, so you can have a dedicated AirPlay mode if you want to use that. So that's actually quite flexible over what you got before. And there's a second page of settings. And we, you saw the auto-rotate. So you could actually use this upside down. So if you put it flat on a desk, you could have the ports at the bottom and the volume control at the bottom. Now, of that, actually speaking of the volume control, you can have, you have two different volume modes. You can either use the control at the top for volume, or there's a setting to make it use the side buttons. And the side buttons are off and will tell you currently using volume wheel for volume adjust, adjustment. So that's that. So you can use either or. And there's a power button, again, on the opposite side of where the M11 Plus one is, and on the other side of your playback controls with one mystery button. And the mystery button you can preset to a number of different things, and I'll, I'll throw up an overlay here. And the only problem with this overlay button, mystery button, is or presetable button, is that you it doesn't, for some of them, things like sample rate indicator doesn't show whether the sample rate has changed. So it kind of... Some of the options are kind of a little bit weird in that they don't quite work. Well, they actually the play pause, I set this as play pause, and I had to actually start playing music in the FIO app before it would work as a play pause button. It's a little bit weird, but kind of handy to have a custom button. Now, some cool things, actually, just below that, you'll see a hold button. Now, each hold is now locked to touchscreen, and you can set in the hold settings, whichever of these buttons are usable, well actually these buttons and, and these buttons, all the touch screen can be locked, all the, and the volume control. 
whether the buttons will activate or not, and each individual one can be set as usable when you're in hold mode, which is really handy, actually. I don't know if you're going to be sticking this in your pocket, but yeah. Um, the other thing is, of course, this battery and DC mode. Now, we're, I'll show that later in the video, but when you, you can switch to battery and DC mode, and you can still charge the battery while this is being connected via DC. And it will, you, because it's Android, you can control how much it charges. So I set it at 85% and I just charged it, just pulled it off the stand and it's at 84%. So 85% is probably about the maximum you want to do to preserve the battery. So that's really cool. Now I've added some apps here. It comes with the Fio app, obviously. Now, if you don't have, it has Play Store. So if you have a Play Store and you, you log into that, you can download. But if you don't want to do with Play Store or, or, or things like APK Pure, which you can you can add in, it has an applications list, which you can download all the common ones directly from Fio, directly download the um, the uh, APKs and install them. And you can see a list there with some and third-party app markets to make it easy. So you can easily get set up with this by default. So as far as you know, features are concerned, well, the main thing. Well, it has quite a lot, if you include this bit of a gamer vibe in here. Everything in the kitchen sink, and being a massive beast, heavy beast of a thing, it, um, well, it has the, the cool, rather simple fan, fan-included desktop stand, and, and a little DC wall wart to include it with it. Inside the actual hardware itself, if we go down to the good old about device, it has, now it doesn't have anything like the latest kind of um, SOC in there. It only has a Snapdragon 660. Same as all this stuff. Everything. The thing is, being a small manufacturer, they can't get. I mean, if you if they if these companies go to one of the big suppliers of things like screens and whatever, and they go, "Hey, I only want you know 10,000 of these things," they go, oh, no, "Sorry, we're not going to do business with you." They want sales of like 100,000, 1 million, or whatever it is. I don't know the numbers. I'm guessing. So, getting you know, one of the things I wished these had was a camera because I want to actually scan QR codes, you know, to, to log into stuff. No, you can't, getting even camera components, for example, which would be handy for some of these devices, you, they can't do. Now, it has a dual 9038 Pro, and we'll talk about that in the sound impressions, and a THX AAA 788 Plus, which I'll talk about because it affects DC mode and all that, which again, sound impressions. And of course, that gigantic battery. And it's necessary because it outputs a fair, you know, we're talking into the watts level of power. Although, of course, there's a limit to that in just, you know, how much you can drain the battery at once. Large screen resolution. So you, the cool thing is, now I won't do it in here, I think. Yeah, I oh, will. Um, you can turn it sideways and chuck it on the stand and watch YouTube on it, which is pretty cool. YouTube or whatever you want to watch. I mean, we're using build number 103. This is downloaded recently. Android 10, of course, and you can see all the different versions in here if you want to know. So if you're watching this video, say, in a year's time after I've made it, there may be some features which are slightly different or features which have been added. So that's kind of what you get, which is <laughs> we're starting off with something big, powerful, chunky, and with something of a gamer vibe with these funky colors. Now, while I've chucked a lot of stuff on here, one last thing I'll quickly show is you can do all the firmware updates very easily, or you can download them and install them yourself separately, or you can just do it directly online. A quick note about software support. Most stuff like, uh, say, USB Audio Player Pro and, you know, say, uh, uh, Cobars and Tidal and all that will be, can do bit perfect output with this. The thing, the outlier, and this is not Fio's fault, is that Rune will not do bit perfect output, unfortunately. When you start playing back, it, it, it will resample down to 48 because it, I don't know, it just doesn't, it's not programmed to recognize these players as being other than generic Android for some reason. So the customization they do on Android 10 to give allow bit perfect output from music players just does not work with Rune for some reason. And yeah, Rune does know about it, and, and I've even bugged them saying this should be something that should be should be fixed. And I don't know why, because a lot of people you know, use these players with things like Rune and, and do want to. Before we get into the sound, let's just take a quick look at the Fio player. Now, one of the cool things I want to mention, one of the useful things, go into play mode, is that it has a thing. Now, if you download this onto your smartphone, the, the settings are slightly different from the, it seems, the DAP versions, but not by much. Now, you have a cool thing called Fio Link, for example, and this is similar to what Hybe has with Hybe Link, in that if I go in here into Fio Music and I go and turn on Fio Link, I can put in an IP address of my 
of the device and then I can connect and remote control it. So if I go in here and for some reason it doesn't go into the play screen, I can go into, if I go here, it's a little bit fiddly, but I doing it over Wi-Fi and I can remote control the player through this. Now, I didn't find as many options for what you can do on the screen here. I've got, there is the newer Fio player, Fio player software versions seem to have all sorts of cool settings for uh, doing stuff like, uh, you know, normal stuff. I just delete. You can pause the video if you want to see what kind of settings they have. I won't go through in, in super detail. But at least they have some better options for things like, you know, the theme stuff. So you can actually set a lot of custom backgrounds or you can have the album art show, you know, as a, as a kind of custom background and other stuff. I usually kind of do based on album I think looks cool. Uh, there's a lot more kind of visual adjustment that's available, like the now playing page, whether it shows a spectrum, which I turned on, or the default, stuff like that. That's a lot better, and I think people will like a lot better. You can sort of see there, the spectrum will show up down the bottom there. But also, it's designed to work bit perfect and work well with the uh, the Fio hardware. And some people online, I haven't tested individual music players in detail in this, seem to find it sounds a little bit better if you're playing. Well, the only thing it doesn't do, it doesn't do streaming. But if you're playing back music off the micro SD card, or it does have options, of course, for things like media server stuff. You can actually scan networks and find, uh, you know, play stuff through a, a DLNA, which is, seems to be more popular in Asia, whereas Rune is maybe more popular in the West. I'm not sure. But otherwise, it has your kind of usual options. And, and on this kind of hardware is, is fairly quick and fairly responsive, especially if you have a fairly quick micro SD card, which I do. But you should be able to see most of the options that are available on your smartphone, and you just won't get any of the hardware-specific ones that you might get for some of the FIO players. So after a quick break, let's get into my impressions of how this performed with, well, everything from in-ear monitors to full-sized headphones. Now, not surprisingly, given that the M17 is the flagship of Fio's line, is that it certainly had flagship performance. You know, generally overall, you know, it was it was pretty excellent. Now, for people who have been kind of around the HeadFi world for a, for a while, they've tried a lot of stuff, I'll give you a quick overview it is typical FIO, you know, it's by the numbers, you know, excellent low THD measurements, and it's a THX based amp for better or for worse. So you do end up having this super, super clean, clear sound, you know, super clean, uncolored sound. And that's not quite everyone's cup of tea. I mean, it would be polar opposite to something like the Wu Audio WA8 Eclipse, which is, you know, a portable tube amp and DAC, which has a very kind of soft, mushy euphonic sound, which is very pleasant to listen with. And actually, after listening with it, which, you know, stuff like the Fio kind of sounds thin. So that turned out, but I mean, performance-wise, I mean, it. I have a pair of Campfire Audio Solaris plugged in here, and they're extremely sensitive in-ear monitors, which pick up hiss out of stuff very readily, and they worked great out of this in low-gain mode. Switch it into DC power desktop mode, and it can drive the serious planers, such as the DCA Stealth and Odyssey LCD5s, which is not something that was normally can be done with portable gear. So let's talk about that because there are some nuances to, to all of this which we and we'll get into some comparisons with some other gear as well. So to start with, well the probably the main thing that's a, the takeaway of this is that it ha has the option of DC power. Now in terms of what that means is that I'm going to talk about the THX amp. Now it mainly was an in, uh, a thing with the you know the full size headphones such as these or I also have Hi Fi Man's Arias in for a review and a, you know the D eight thousand Pro and a whole bunch of stuff off off screen which you may have seen if you've watched my other videos. An issue I've had with THX amps is that they seem to be. You know, this is an issue with amps which are designed to be uh, have low THD numbers as the primary focus and don't and ignore like overall actual performance with music. Now a music of course is you know not just a single one kilohertz sine wave, it is you know constantly fluctuating, and the power supply in a in an amplifier is is the drain on it is is constant and varying. So what happens when you have a power supply is it has to have a degree of capacitance in there to store you know spare power for to deal with these fluctuations. It's kind of like having you know having extra revs on tap in your car kind of thing, and I found that the amp inside the M17 did suffer in that way in that when you do plug in the DC power supply for example and you when you do that you know you put the this switch on the side it prompts up this prompt to uh, to the ovary headphone mode which uh, you know allows DC power and it can bypass the battery entirely or it can still charge the battery which can be which we assume we can set on or off and then 
And if you're playing music, it will get a little bit quieter and a little bit louder. And if you unplug it or switch it off, it'll get a little bit quieter again. But it sounds more full. You know, there's more meat to the sound if you are in DC mode, you know, with full-sized headphones. And there's, you know, more bass comes through. And I noticed the same thing with the, say, Drop THX AAA 789 and AAA 1, is that if you plugged in a better power supply than the war water it came with, you got more a more full bass. And you think, well, but, you know, distortion, distortion. No, 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 you don't understand. This is playing music, not playing a sine wave. You just got more bass because a sine wave is only one kilohertz. And something that people have observed is that, especially in cheap amps, which are designed with low THD numbers, is that when you actually play the measure of the distortion, specifically on a low frequency, you find that it's higher in the amp than they it seems to suggest. And... You notice that that's why you get more bass coming through. Now you get a, it's very easy to get a much higher SPL or sound pressure level with something with low bass. So say like Cradle to the Grave, which is a uh, from a movie soundtrack and has very low bass rumble because it's designed to be used in a cinema. You know the low bass rumble is designed to sound a little bit scary. Uh, you know give more power to the sound and all that. And I found that listening, I was testing my the SPL through my headphones when I was listening to some music and listening to CC Coletti. You know, I might be listening at, say, 70, 80 dBs, but if I was listening in what sounded like a similar SPL to this Cradle to the Grave, because of the bass notes, it was I was actually listening at, say, 90, over 100 dB. And I actually managed to get an amp to clip that way. It was the bass was actually over 100 dB, but it didn't sound loud. It wasn't really rumbling the headphones or anything. It just didn't... It sounded, you know, louder than my normal listening level, but it didn't sound super loud, but it was the bass specifically that was doing that. And the bass was putting much heavier demand on... The amplification I was testing and I got it to clipping and it actually confirmed with the manufacturer that was a clipping point by doing some quick calculations with the headphones which was Susvaras and incidentally. Now this won't power Susvaras too well, it can, I mean if you don't listen loud but you're not going to put Cradle to the Grave through it. But it will power these things which is pretty amazing. I mean you can power other, you can power, you know, I can put plug it in the headphones into say the M11 Plus but it just won't do anywhere near as good a job as this the M17 can do in DC mode. Now, speaking of that, so you got a more full sound in DC mode. Now, actually, this is not the actual power supply I plugged in. It's something else. It is, and I'll unplug it and show you. It's actually a little, couple of things I found in Japan, which cost about, about 15 bucks each, actually, was extra power supply filter and extra capacitance. So this is the capacitors act as a little extra storage for when the sound, you know, to, to the amp draws on more power during, you know, busy passages and that, that kind of thing. And this kind of stuff is what you see in a high quality power supply. For example, if you look at, say, the IFI's power supply they use for things like the, the Pro IDSD and that, that has this kind of stuff in it. So you have some filter chokes in there and, and uh, some uh, capacitors for the, the power. And if you use something, I mean, unfortunately, they only make a 15 volt version, but if they made a 12 volt version, it'd be good for something like this. Now, you can get a linear power supply, and of course, linear power supplies have this kind of stuff in there. They have filters to some degree, depending on the quality of the LPS, and they do have more capacitance, although probably larger capacitors, same kind of thing. And I found that these plugging these into the M17 did improve the sound even further. So you got a little bit more clarity in there, a little bit more clarity, especially in, in the bass regions. So, and it didn't base boost the bass anymore, it seemed. It just seemed to make it a little bit more clearer. So that was an interesting thing, and I used these same things. This was one of the, I used these on THX amps too, on the things like the AAA 789, and these uh, did help with the bass and that kind of thing. So there's still, if you're into the kind of tweaking, you know, improving stuff, you know, with tweaks, with better power supplies, definitely might be worth trying out, say, some kind of linear power supply. And I'm sorry, I can't recommend a particular brand. The one I own is DIY. And see if it kind of improves things. I mean, unfortunately, the, these, these banks are kind of available only in Japan, but that'd be ideal because they're cheap. So that kind of put the amplification in this in its place. But still, and don't get me wrong, I mean, let's compare it to the N8 Mark II. So this is a you know really great portable player. It will power full-sized headphones. It has tube mode. But the overall kind of tuning of this is typical Kain. It's kind of on the warm side. It's kind of on the euphonic side. It's really nice with a lot of IEMs with kind of a sharper treble as well. And, you know, stuff like actually like Fio IEMs, which some of them like the uh, FH series, which do have a little bit of a sharp and edgy treble. So it was a kind of opposite the Fio, which is kind of super clean, super clear, uh, kind of open sound. This had a kind of, you know, thicker sound, especially with the tubes engaged and, you know, more warm, euphonic and nice. But if you plugged in the full-sized headphones, even the Stealth especially, which is 
quite demanding for a pair of full-sized headphones being uh, low sensitivity and low impedance, it didn't drive them, this couldn't drive them as well as the M17 does. So even though this is one and a half, you know, 15, almost $1,500, $1,400 more expensive, $1,500, I can't remember, then this works best with, you know, high-end in-ear monitors is where it did its best job and maybe some less demanding planers if you wanted to go down that route. But you, I think people in Southeast Asia are going to be buying this with high-end IEMs, going by my impressions. So that's something that the M17 had the advantage is that desktop mode and its general overall full-sized headphone drive, even not in DC mode. But again, it sounded a little bit more on the thin side, given that THX amp and given how FIO tends to tune things. Now, compared to say something like the M11 Plus, it's definitely a step up. And especially in DC mode, it's going to be a step up. You sounded... Some people have described the M11 Plus as sounding a touch warm. I'd probably say it sounds a touch thicker than the more, the kind of thinner and more open and clear sound of the M17. So it was a little bit of a step down. Noticeable, not dramatic, but mainly with full-sized headphones, it was most noticeable, but it was still very noticeable with something like a good pair of in-ear monitors like this, you know, Campfire Solaris. Probably the one people are going to ask me about is the Hugo 2. And this is a kind of an unfair comparison because this is a dedicated DAC amp. It doesn't use the off-the-shelf chip. It is designed like cord gear to reproduce music as music and is, and is radically different in terms of how it actually works. I mean, ignoring the two go, I mean, you just have a DAC amp, whereas this has the, the full kit with Android and everything. This you have to do use with a phone or a computer or something like that, or the streamer or some other streamer. And the, the M17, like a typical ESS DAC based device, seems to impose its own kind of color across all music. Now, overall, if you hadn't told me what was in this, I wouldn't have known it was an ESS based thing. It doesn't have that edginess that some ESS gear has. It just sounds, you know, very open. I mean, I would have guessed it was AKM at a start, but it doesn't have that kind of what I call glassy sound to AKM where it feels like you're looking through a window or high-end AKM like the 4497 and 4499. It, it doesn't have that slightly kind of, I, I kind of analog, analogize the Burr Brown sound that say IFI uses as being more like wood. You know, wood has its own natural imperfections, which are nice, but they're still imperfections. I tend to think of ESS, which is what's in here as being more like metal. And that can be dull. It can be sharp. And I found this to be very polished metal in that analogy. And I use a kind of like, imagine you have a coffee table made out of metal or glass or wood and how it subtly affects you know, the atmosphere of a room. That's what this is. It's, it's more like very highly polished metal that could almost be mistaken for something else. And I think in that way, it doesn't seem to have, has the least amount of kind of coloration, but there's still this, it, everything comes through in one particular type of uh, way. Whereas say the chord gear, you know, if you have a violin or different kinds of different violins and different trumpets sound like different violins and different trumpets, it, each instrument sounds like the actual instrument is, and there's not a particular color imposed over it with the chord gear. Whereas you do have that with a standard DAC, it imposes the slight, a slight coloration over everything. And it's very subtle. I mean, it's only in comparison I really noticed this and it's like, okay, this is still a step up. It might not have quite the power output, but the Hugo 2's power output is not quite done the same way as something like this. It's more of a complex issue. So that was kind of where it sat. I'd still say for ultimate, you know, instrument reproduction, sorry, the Hugo 2 just still wins. I still consider it the, the, the portable king. But as a desktop amp, holy cow, I mean, if you like that kind of super, you know, uncolored sound and you want to drive full-sized headphones it, and stick it on your desk in DC mode, it absolutely kicks ass in that way. And, you know, you can switch to in-ear in monitors anytime and you don't have to compromise anything. And it's convenient. It has this nice stand which allows it to be plonked on the desk. Or you can just take it off and, and take it somewhere if you don't mind the ridiculously si ridiculous size and weight. But it's still smaller than a desktop amp. And it has, you can put all the music in there with some caveats. And that's kind of the thing where there's a couple of small issues. So let me talk about the stand for a minute. And the stand was not perfectly thought out, but it was thought out. The main issue is the M17 gets hot. And, you know, playing back, say, DSD, or if you do the alter DSD or some high res or something, after a while, it starts to get quite warm. And then you have this. And I'm going to bring it close to the microphone to understand what the problem is. So it gets hot. And then you decide to turn on the fan to cool it down and you get this. Uh, yeah, 
No. Uh, even if you turn it down to the lower speed, I've got two speeds on there, get that in focus. Still, I mean, with the, that there, let's see if you can still hear it. Now, the microphone's directional, so... Yeah, you can sort of hear it. I've got my aircon in the background, too. Now, do you see the problem? Now, someone did on Amazon UK find an identically sized fan and replaced the internal fan, which requires some desoldering and soldering, and it got to be quieter. Now, the thing is, it really needed that the mid-speed was the highest speed and that the and a lower speed still was available because you want to have really low spinning fan. You could conceivably, if you can find something the right size, you'd have to help get this whole black plate off and do some modifications. If it took a thicker full-sized fan, maybe you could it, something could be done there. But yeah, that's kind of tricky because then you could get something like a some of those silent fans that are available, Noct Noctua or something like that, which I have actually replaced all my driver arrays with Noctua fans. Um, interesting thing you can do is you actually take off these full screws and you can actually turn this upside down if you want to have the USB coming in the top. But speaking of upside down, one niggle I have is I wish this was had was flex. I wish this could bend to a particular angle. I mean, this angle is about right for the desktop. Now, the it has of course a hole in the bottom for putting the cables through, and then of course it has a hole here for you know access to the ports. It has this hole, which I don't understand. I guess it's for airflow, and one of the things is, well, let's say you want to use it to say what you're going to watch movies and you have it sitting sideways. Now, it will rotate automatically if you set that on. Okay, that's fine. Now, do you see there's a slight issue? Yeah, the fan's in a kind of an odd place. It's kind of should have been down the bottom. But, I mean, that would have been probably interfered with the port slightly. But, you know, what if you want to turn this upside down? Well, you could do that and have your headphones coming through the bottom and you power through the top. Problem is, so let's turn it the right way up and have a look. Okay. Right way up. Okay, ports are accessible. No problem there. Other way up. Uh, we have a problem. So it's kind of like Theo thought about it, but didn't think about it enough. Now, I don't think everyone, many people are going to be turning this thing upside down to use it. I think that's an unusual case scenario, but that's my feeling. And I feel like you know, in using it, for example, if I say I set the, the special you know, custom button here to be change the digital filters, then, okay, where's the indicator to tell me what filter I'm using? That kind of little thing wasn't entirely thought out fully. And that's the only kind of niggle I have with this is, again, someone doesn't, you don't, I mean, with all gear, you, things aren't quite thought out fully. I mean, you have the Hugo 2, you know, if you have large RCA plugs, you're in trouble, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, that was, there are reasons for that. But I mean, with this, you'd hope they'd think it out a little bit more. So they almost did. So, but for the most part, I think it, they did a really pretty excellent job. Again, where it kicks ass most is in desktop mode, where it actually can do a good job with full-sized headphones like the Stealth and the, L the LCD5s. And these normally require desktop amps to get the most out of. You can get pretty much the most out of them with an M17. And this is, you know, one device, which is really cool. They've got this particular niche or niche where they've, it's a pretty much a desktop device with high amount of power where someone wants one device that does everything. And that's where it, it really kicks ass in that way. So if I was to give it a star rating, I'd probably say four out of five stars or four and a half. I mean, it would lose half a star before not because nothing's perfect. I mean, five stars should be for stuff that's perfect and nothing really is. But, I mean, even if I were to, say, argue, say that some things could, maybe the amplification, you know, I might find it could only works best in DC mode. If I were to argue that, at least for full-sized headphones, I'd probably say, oh, maybe, I, what if I took off an extra half a star? But it's more than made up for the fact that it can, has a DC mode. It can do, it can have, it has all this IO in here, which can be used for output to other devices or input, whether SPDF is two-way, USB is two-way, you can have, you can attach, I think you can attach drives to it and have music on that. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. You know, it has every port you need. Um, it has all that the funky lighting thing if you care about that. The only kind of thing is like, why did they put the power, why did they reverse, you know, the, the power buttons on the opposite side and the playback button? I don't know why. Um, you know, it only affects you if you use more than one piece of FIO gear. So they all, it was almost there. So I feel like four and a half stars is kind of a, a good one for that. And for value, I mean, okay, this is what three and a, almost three and a half grand and it can't do what the M17 can in many respects. I mean, it sounds nicer in some respects if you like that warmer kind of tubier sound and 
in some ways I, pre I wish I had the sound of this with this kind of power would be perfect for me almost there but still a really kick-ass thing from Fio to make this M17 device and if you you know want something to, to one device to sit in your desktop I can happily I found I could happily use it in that way next to my computer if I had a minimal setup so I hope that gave you a good idea of how the M17 performs and we had a look through all the all the features if you'd like my buying advice or like th further impressions or questions about how this performs with different headphones and things, consider becoming a supporter. And supporters, even for you know, a couple of bucks a month, happily answer as, as many questions as you like. You can join in. We have a private community. It's not like normal Discord chats, which are full of, well, a lot of people, weird and bizarre people. It's, full, it's older, more mature, more sensible chats. Someone asked me about that before joining, actually. And we do go through a lot of portable gear and, and full-size gear and, and test stuff out and and it's it's much it's a really nice place to and i met some really fantastic people through there so i hope you consider joining and, and being part of that and as as always thanks for watching and uh, well i look forward to maybe seeing you on my discord